today. That's George Jones, he stopped loving her today. Probably one of the greatest songs, country songs ever written. Voted as such a couple of times in going in there. And in my 40 years of broadcasting, it's been one of those songs that I always turn to if I want just a little comfort with it. 40 years? 40 years as long as I've had these headphones, cans, whatever you like to call them. We call them cans, they call them headphones. And I bought those in December 78. I pay 60 quid for them. I've had various bits on them, new pads and new headband for them, but they are still, still good, and they're still playing a lot of great country music as it goes out. Let's carry on now here. You're listening to WCRFM 101.8, the station that brings much more music to Wolverhampton and probably more country music than most. And this particular song we're going to now is B.B. Hexer and Florida Georgia Line. Meant to be 36 weeks at number one on the American charts. I'm Jim Duncan, and this is Great Country. Baby, lay on back and relax. Kick your pretty feet we up kick off from dad. when you first joined Beacon, what led you to Beacon in the first place? Well, actually, I, I, I'd come up from Southampton area. I, I worked in Southampton. I've been into country music a long time down in Southampton, and we work with live music down there. Um, my country music roots go right back to as a very young child. Uh, my mother uh, used to have the radio on and she loved country music, so I followed with country music. And uh, we actually uh, used to follow, there was a Canadian living over here at the time. Uh, I dare I say that I'm old enough to be in the war sort of thing. So during the war, there was this fella called Big Bill Campbell. And as an eight year old, my mother took me to go and see Big Bill Campbell in the middle of the war, blackout and everything like that. He was my hero, my country hero. Mm. And I went to that. And I was hooked from there on in. And I followed it right the way through. She used to listen to AFN, the American Forces Network, coming out of Stuttgart. And they used to broadcast everything. We had Hank Williams broadcasting live when he was out there to the troops right. in 49. That was great. So I had this background of music. And I came up here, uh, working up here. I was an engineer in a factory at the time. And I, and I, ca I came up at times and things were, were doing okay. And I got into the local country music scene and Beacon Radio started in 76. Um, they started off in 76 down the Technical Road and it was wonderful, you know, it was local radio. People were talking about local people, they were talking about us in Wolverhampton, we were there. And I, I knew where they were talking about, although it was strange, it was my town, they were talking about it. And it came on and then the decree came out from the Broadcasting Authority, you must diverse, you must have lots of separate programmes. And so they told Beacon that they should have a country music programme. And they gave it to uh, one of their uh, fellows who worked under the name of Dave Austin, um, later become famous as Austin Powell and worked on uh, WCR for a long time. But um, uh, Austin broadcast, we really used to listen to Austin because we could send the gig guides of the events that we were promoting into him and he'd read them out free publicity it was wonderful you know so we had that and it was good and he invited local people in like doing the show like i said you you've got your club come in and sit in on my show bring your 10 favorite songs with you we'll talk about you your club and your music and that was it i went in one show and i was totally hooked so that was it and i then came back and i went in um uh, austin moved on and various other people they wanted other people to come in and somebody said, oh, that bloke who used to come in with Austin, Jim Duncan, let's ask him back. And I got in, suddenly my feet were under the table, and I was then the country music jock on Beacon Radio, which was great because that was then to last for the next 20 years. That was, that was very, very good. Do you remember your first actual show? What was the date of it? Uh, October, I think it was, it was October, it was the third week in October, I think, 1978. Wow. That, that was... That was the uh, first one that went in. So I'm looking for October 78 this year, and I'll have had 40 hours winding up the airwaves with country music, you know, it's, which is an alien form. Uh, the Midlands is noted for its rock and everything like that. But in those early days, there was something like when I used to do a gig guide, you'd read out 40 odd different clubs in the circulation area of Beacon that would pick up on that. So that's 40 clubs with 150, 200 people in. You got a good core audience before you start picking up the people that sit at home and listen to you. And can you play me some Jim Reeves, please? You know, and things like that. It all came in, oh, yeah. and these these things happened. You know, and it, it came in, but it was so delightful. You know, and uh, I have always kept so that I play the new music. So like when music is issued and when it comes out, um, one of the, the favourite tracks, similar to like this one. This is. Uh, 
George Jones, he stopped loving her today. When that first came out, that came out and we played it, and we, we played it on, on Beacon at the time, and it came out and it went out. That was it. We were playing that as new music. People are still playing it today, and they're, they're ignoring the new music. And I think you have to go with the new music. So I still keep with the new music. I have the new music, the latest stuff that comes in, whether it's whoever it is from Taylor Swift right the way up through, and it all happens. Because as well as doing the radio stuff, you, you, you write as well, don't you? Yes, I, um, part of it as part of being uh, working like the country music clubs, uh, you then... Uh, uh, country music magazines were the means of getting the knowledge of where the bands were, who the bands were and what they were doing. And there came a vacancy for the Midlands to become a journalist. And I thought, hello, I can write my name, I can do this. So I started doing that and I, I became fairly well known as a journalist, first off on Country Music Roundup and then later on I worked for a couple of other magazines and then I became editor of Cross Country uh, when that started, um, oh, uh, 2009, 2010. I was editor of that, and I thought, hello, I'm an editor. <laughs> I'm very, very good. And it has some great things because you get things, um, this is one of my great prides, this particular one here. This is the back of an album sleeve, and on the bottom here it says, the sleeve notes written by Jim Duncan, radio presenter and reporter. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's me. <laughs> That's something I'm very, very proud of, you know. Uh, as a delight of that, I actually got to speak on one of the songs. I can't sing, but I can <laughs> speak, so I said a couple of words at the end of a song, you know. So that was it. So that, that was it. So writing is still very much... I still write a lot for it. I still write the lead column for a magazine uh, each month, sort of like lead off about whatever's happened with it. Radio is the subject this month. What is radio the effect on there? compared with the, this new dreaded, uh, oh, I'm on Facebook, Lurgy, Spotify, Deezer, whatever that is, you know, and these things that happen, you know. So you but, still believe in the, the, the good old-fashioned journalism and you know, I, the I believe magazines. I believe in written journalism because um, you can have people gaze at, kids gaze at their phone, adults look at their phone, but they read newspapers and they read magazines because they like reading things. I mean, the current big thing about one of the politicians at the moment it's an article he wrote in a newspaper. Newspapers aren't just for fish and chips, they're for reading, aren't they? Mm. You know, they go in. So then, back to Beacon in the late 70s. Um, what was it like there? Oh, it was hilarious. The lead man, uh, the top man, was a Yank. He was an American. He was a true American. Uh, he knew radio. Ra America, radio is America. You know, broadcasting was British broadcasting from the British Broadcasting Company. Radio is America, and he came in and he wanted an American radio station. He went out and he had jingles that people would die for, you know. Uh, they're now collector's items. People collect them, you know. Uh, I, I've got friends that co collect jingles from Beacon early days, you know. The sunshine days, you know, the sunshine sound, and they were wonderful. And he would come in and he would drive you on all the time. And he had this great enthusiasm. If you were enthusiastic on radio, he was fine. Two things you had to do. There's one of our presenters on here, he was an old Beacon man, he was head of music in those days, called Mick Wright. And he was in the studio one day with me and uh, I, I was doing my thing and he said to me, one thing you've got to do, he said, every time you open that mic fader, smile. And he said, if you smile, you sound good. Don't matter how miserable they are, people aren't interested in that. Just smile when you talk. And that makes all the difference. Everything all comes out and everybody just loves it. Mm -hmm. And it's fine. But it was good. I remember um, him coming back from a trip to America, uh, Jay, Jay Oliver, you know, and he came back. And he walked into the studio and he had a couple of LPs on his arm. Now, LPs were, were the lifeblood of it. It was all done. Uh, you had to turn it. You had to learn how to cue things up. You didn't use things like CDs or... or uh, myriads or anything like that. It was all done. You had to queue it up, queue up whether you were queuing singles or whether you were queuing albums. Then you had to remember to change over. One's 33 and the other's 45, you know, and 33 at 45, don't know, sounds strange. You know, do that again and you're off air, you know, that, that was the maxim. But he came in and he chucked a couple of CDs down in front of me and he said, play them, they're good. I'd never heard of the bloke before, a fella called Chris Ledoux. Rodeo Rider, he said, he's great, he's going to be big. And he was marvellous. And I was playing Chris Ledoux before any of the other stations in the UK were playing Chris Ledoux because Jay had brought me the things over. 
Later on, Garth Brooks wrote a song, and he put a worn-out tape of Chris Ledoux in his car radio, and he revived Chris Ledoux's thing, and everybody was talking about Chris Ledoux, and I said, I've been playing him for years, since the late 70s, I was playing him, you know, and it was things like that. And it went through, it had its ups and downs, it had its managing directors that came and went, you know, different ones, had different styling. We have one bloke there from the army, he came out of uh, Br Br British Broadcasting, you know, from the forces one. Uh, we all had to sit to attention and wear ties, you know, and it was things like that. But uh, uh, I don't think you're saying that absolutely correctly. No, that's the way I talk, I talk like this. I don't talk like this, you know, and that's the way the people go, you know. I mean, you must have had um, other advice as well, because it was your, your first time actually sort of doing your own thing on radio, wasn't it? You know, who yeah. were the people who would offer advice who you really valued? The other jocks were the ones. The other jocks would look after you. Your peers all came in, and they didn't want you to fail, because they didn't want a failure in there. And they would come in and do it with you. They would do things... Um, one of the great jocks, he's now working out of California, Tony Paul, he used to sit there with me, and I was doing double headers with him, and he would come in and he'd chuck me an album sleeve and say, describe that album sleeve to me so I'm interested in it and I want to go and look for it. And he'd make you do it and he'd make you do it until you got it right, you know, and you do things like that. We had windows like these on the side and you'd be talking away and you'd be fa you'd face the window. And these other jocks would go there and they'd moon at you when you're halfway through a link. And I mean, there's nothing like trying to keep a straight face in a good serious bit when you're doing it and somebody's mooning at you through the window. But that's what the atmosphere it was in there and it was very, very good. I used to do a six hour shift uh, in there. I used to do a six hour shift six days a week. Um, but the great thing about it was the then uh, fellow called Pete Wagstaff, he was a great one for giving you your reign. He'd let you go, you know. Mm. If you were good and you had the figures, you weren't broke. And he wasn't going to change you a lot. He'd change you on certain things if he wanted a show done and he'd want you to do that. But what you were doing, you did it good. And he gave me country music, two-hour show, every night of the week. Nowhere in England was anybody broadcasting 16 hours of country music a week. And Beacon was doing it, and we were doing that. And that. I, I got an award off a magazine for that. Uh, the DJ, DJ of the month or something it was, Jim Duncan broadcasting to the world sort of thing. And I thought, yeah, that's good, I enjoyed that. You must have been quite proud. Oh, I was very, very proud. Yeah. You picked up all sorts of things. You picked up awards um, over the times. I picked up one, this was off a magazine called Southern Country, and uh, it's Services Award 2007, Jim Duncan, WCR 1350. <laughs> that is in the days before when we were on AM radio. Um, yeah. I had another one that came in later, this came in 2017. This is services to radio um, and services to country music from the British Country Music Association. Right. Those, those things made it very, very good for me, you know, and I, I was um, very, very proud to receive those. Um, then I went on to receive another services to industry one, again from the BM, BCMA, because I, the BCMA we started around about the 60s, late 60s, things like that. I mean, mm. As radio jocks, we all went into it because that was our way of keeping into the industry. Mm. And the BCMA then, as the people who founded it died, they didn't replace them. And it all found out. And it ended up with one man who eventually abandoned the whole thing midstream, sort of like beginning mid 80s, and the BCMA drifted away. Mm. So, around about 2000, um, I teamed up with the editor of a magazine and said, let's start the BCMA and awards thing like that. And that was the, the thing that started it all up. And we, we revived it. And now it's a big thing. It's uh, this year's BCMA awards are taking place in Harrogate, 2000 seat uh, one. Last year it was at the Wolfram in Wolverhampton. Well, so it moves around the country and it's big things. Well, that's cool. Now, at Beacon, in the 80s, things were changing. Um, they split the FM station with an AM station. They yep. called the AM station, nice and easy radio, WABC. And you moved on to WABC. I got the job on WABC because previously uh, I was on Beacon just as a country jock. And as a country jock, uh, you only did your show and that was it. I, I wasn't used on the other shows. And we were having the Christmas, Christmas Bash, uh, uh, a little Indian restaurant just by the bridge at Bridge North as you go over to it. Oh. Um, and we were all in there, the raucous lot of jocks, they're throwing bread rolls all over <laughs> everywhere, you know, and things <laughs> that like that. That sounds normal. And at the end of it, we were going out there, and Wag, who was the programme director there, came out and said, uh, we're starting WABC, I need a jock for the evening, do you want the job? We're walking up the stairs, I mean, no formal interviews or anything like that. I said, I'd love it. 
OK, he said, come and see me on Monday and we'll set it all up and that's it, you've got that shift. And I had that shift then for uh, right the way up through until uh, 98 when it finished. And mm -hmm. th this was sort of like in the 80s when they started WABC. And with WABC, I got this six hour shift in the evening. Well, the first hour was drive, uh, which uh, to the uninitiated, you're taking people home in their cars sort of thing. So you have to say you've got a traffic jam so-and-so and you do all the bits and pieces and you do that. And then it came in, then we came into what they call specialist shows and WAG was a great one for specialist shows. So I was doing uh, specialist shows. I had, I did organ music. I, I, did, I knew about every Wurlitzer and Compton in this area that was playing. The ones, whether they're at Shrewsbury or whether they are the Compton up in there or the big new thing they built down in Birmingham and all those are organs. I knew all, I knew all about that. Uh, all, all the different uh, organ players there were. And suddenly I got an organist to come in with me, so we talked about that. And I, I made that very successful. It was tremendous. Uh, the, the Organ Society actually wrote about, listen to, B, uh, listen to WABC, uh, there's a bloke on there called Jim Duncan talks all about organs. I hadn't met an organ before until we started, but it came in and it worked. And then we had, we used to do cinema music. And I had a cinema projectionist from Telford, from one of the multiplexes over there. He came and sat in with me and we used to play all the cinema songs. Everything from Judy Garland, Fred Astaire, to right up to the new songs that came in. We talk about the new pictures and things like that. That was really good. And the spin-off bonus of that was, to be able to talk to him on his show on that, he'd say, oh, I've got a new film today, come and have a look at it. And I would go over there at 10 o'clock in the morning, sit in this multiplex, big multiplex on my own, he'd give me a bag of popcorn, go up in the projection room, put the film on, and I'd sit in there on my own and have a private showing of every right. every major film that came out so we could talk about it on air. It was good for them, it was good for me, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> and we did that. And then we, we went to classical music, mm -hmm. and classical music was something... I, I knew the skaters waltz because I took piano lessons at one time and that was about it. But we then got, I had to get into classical music, so I had all these magnificent classical albums and people would donate them to me and bring them in. I had all these classical albums and I, I, the best I ever did on a classical program was three, three, three tracks. I played three tracks in an hour. <laughs> and as a total contrast to that, I used to do a rock and roll show and the rock and roll show was all from the late 40s, 50s, right up until 1963. That was the cut-off date. When the Beatles came in, rock and roll died, sort of thing. So it was just rock and roll. Mm. It was straight rock and roll. Tracks there from 1 minute 12 seconds up to a long track would be 2 minutes 10. 26 tracks in an hour playing off vinyl is the best I did on that. So I went from 3 to 5 playing that. You had to be fairly versatile. I used to have cakes and coffee in there as well to keep me going. But <laughs> used to do all things like that. It was wonderful. You used to do bits and pieces like that. I, I did an Irish program, so I was an honorary member of the Irish club down here in Wolverhampton. I used to go to the Irish club in Birmingham. I got to MC all these things with the Irish. I got to know all the Irish artists as well. Yeah. So I've got like Brendan Shine and all them in there. They're, they're all talking, they're all coming in, talking to everything on there. So it was all part of it. If you wanted to do an interview, you did the interview and you said, I've got so-and-so coming in. Nobody, nobody ever said, who's that? Why have you got them in? They relied totally on your knowledge and your ability to say that that person you're bringing in there has got something to offer the radio station, the listeners and things like that. And they come in and people to ring up and say, oh, he's nice, and do things like that. While all this is going on, you'd run a, a competition over the night. You'd get somebody to give com They were great competition things. We'd have the main studio competition where we gave away cars and things like that to giving away CDs. You'd give me your CD and I'd give away your CD or your book or something like that. And we'd have the competition phone in. So you had a bank of 10 phone numbers and you were answering these phone numbers, writing the numbers down. You didn't have an assistant or anything like that. You're doing that. You've still got to sound normal and playing whatever music you're playing. You're going on and doing that. And then draw it out at the end of the night, ring them up and send it off. You had to do all that. That was all part of your job. Keeps you busy. <laughs> it was very But the, the best bit of the lot was then when they came up, football season. Oh, it's football season. We'll take football reports. Now, WABC was WABC West Midlands, 
which broadcast all the way over the black country and everywhere, and then WABC Shropshire, which was Shropshire. We used to say it was uh, Wales and the border counties. That was what we brought, broadcast it to. And uh, Wolverhampton and the black country was what WABC stood for before. We didn't say it was a radio station in New York. It sounded good, you know. So yeah. that was the way it went. And you'd have these two, so you had a split and you had split, so you'd take the splits and sometimes you'd have split, the ads would come in, you'd have to split your ads. Mm. Now the ads weren't nicely tied up on a machine where you pressed a button and it came through. You had what they called carts, which were big eight tracks, and you stuck them in this machine, and if you were doing football, you used to have to go and run down the corridor to wipe them off so you could take the next report, and you haven't taken reports on it. You'd go home at 12 o'clock and you'd be absolutely exhausted, and they'd say, what do you do? Oh, I'd sit in a room and talk to myself all night. <laughs> I remember it was around that time that I first met you. It would have been about 89, 90, and I was doing the, the, the music logging, you know. Oh, you the, know, the, the PRS. The, the, the PRS. You come yeah. in with the PRS, and you come in, and I'm playing a track by uh, John Truskoski. How do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> and he's got 15 other writers on there. As go, and then it's got the publisher, and you've got to put the publisher, the writer, That's the it. album and the, the number of the album would all go down. I missed those last two. I'm going out to get a coffee. Can you give us the last three? You know, oh, I, I admire you lads when you came in and did that. There was one I remember from the, sort of the, the, the speciality music hour, if you like. Um, the, it was Brian Smith and his Happy Piano. I just remember that. You would play that all the time, I seem to remember. <laughs> just one of those things you remember. Bri Brian Smith was one of those very talented uh, piano players, organ players, and he, he used to work as a trio. He'd have a drummer and a bass player with him and he'd play his piano, but he was very, very popular. He was like Klaus Wunderlitz on the organ, and these things were coming, and people loved that music, and you got jolly music, and it goes in. But because I was a couple of years older than the others, uh, I knew the other music, so I could play in, I, I, I knew Glenn, I'd heard Glenn Miller live, you know, sort of thing, String of Pearls, we could do the whole lot, we go through. I knew the whole bands you come through, anybody you talked about, I knew and I could talk about it. I didn't need notes, I could just go ahead and talk about it. It was good. You say you did interviews, I mean, who were some of the famous people you'd talked to over the years? I remember doing an interview with Anthony Newley. Uh, he's at home in Brighton and he's publishing his new, I think it was a book he was doing, and he was doing a book, and his agent had rang through and said, oh, here's the number for Anthony, will you ring him at so-and-so time? He'd do that and go in, Anthony will come in live. And they were all done live on the, on the show. He'd go in, I'll ring Anthony. Uh, don't talk about Joan. That's Joan Collins, his wife, because they had rather an acrimonious split. Hmm. So we're two minutes into the interview, we're talking about Anthony Newley and him playing uh, the Artful Dodger and doing all his songs, you know, and uh, his great singing style, because he had a tremendous singing style. And we did all that into it. And he said, you haven't mentioned Joan yet. Are we going to talk about her? And I said, yeah, if you like. So we talked about Joan for about 10 minutes, and that was good. And I can imagine his agent there going absolutely berserk about it. <laughs> One of the other interviews I did was with uh, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett, of course, I left my heart in San Francisco. You know, a tremendous singer. Uh, he's a great singer. He's got a great style. I mean, he's 90-odd, and he's still singing now. Mm -hmm. And he's still performing. But I got him in, and I thought, well, Let's make my interview just a little bit better. So Tony Bennett is a great painter. He loves painting. And I used to talk to him about, I started talking to him about his painting and his artwork and his exhibitions. And he was saying, and he used a phrase I'd never heard before. He said, I go out and I do some grosh. And I thought, grosh? So I, I must look back. He said, it's actually, it's when you go out and you see a lovely scene you're going to do, and you just get some pencils and you just do a very quick, sketch of it and go and that's the grosh of that scene and you go back in the studio and recreate it and you do that and you paint it and you can paint it and it perhaps take you a month to paint to do the painting afterwards but you've got this grosh you did beforehand mm -hmm. and he said i always try and do something where i go i love buildings and then we started talking about buildings and things like that and then i i got round to my my field uh, tell me about your country music fields to tony bennett the jazz singer the great big bands here what about your country music and he gave me a wonderful story to me. He said, uh, I did this. He said, I would recorded Cold Cold Heart. He said, and I got Cold Cold Heart and I released it. And it went out and it, it went to number one, he said, and it became a million seller. And he said, I get this phone call from this fella down in the Midwest. And it's Hank Williams, the man who wrote it. And he said, Hank Williams says, hey, what have you done to my song? And he said, well, actually, Hank, I've made it into a million seller. And he said, 
all he said was thank you <laughs> and that was the end of it you know and it came in he did that and we, we talked about that you know and we discussed the carpenters with um Jambalai, you know following that on and tony bennett deciding he would like to have gone into that but the people wanted him to stay with big bands but although he was known as a big band singer tony bennett never ever sang with a big band <laughs> he was a singer on a stage he'd come out and he'd sing and he'd have the orchestra you know, 35-piece orchestra behind him and all the rest. But it was never a band, never Tony Bennett and his band, not like Sinatra and all the other singers who had bands. Yeah. And he, he was different to that. I did Gene Pitney. Yeah. Uh, Gene Pitney was another one that I managed to get through and talk about country music because he did a great country music thing. He did recording with jo George Jones, Melbourne Montgomery and those. And he went down into Nashville. And he was in Nashville. And he'd done these songs. And he was telling me about the songs he'd done. And they wanted him to stay as a country singer in Nashville. He said, I'm a Greek boy in uh, New York. He said, what do I know about country music? He said, you've got the voice for it, you can do it. But he said, I didn't do it, I stayed with country music. But he said, I still love the songs and go in. And he was telling me the story. He had, uh, he'd write, written the song um, Rubber Ball and he'd put his mother on as co-writer. Now he said, my mother had come into America and she'd come over there to me, she'd come from Greek. She didn't speak any American at all. He said, she, she just spoke Greek. So he said, I told her, I explained to her that she was a co-writer on this so that she would get money from it when the, the revenue came in. Bobby V had a number one with it. Mm -hmm. And he came in and he said, you have to learn it. And he said, the only way I could teach her was to keep it the same bouncy, bouncy. And that was the only bit she could remember. And she was terrified the inland revenue were going to come round and ask to speak to her because she couldn't speak. <laughs> and he worried about these stories. But there was lots of people like those. Um, like Vera Lynn's opposite, Anne Shelton. Now, when we were doing the 1940s, it was one of the anniversaries that we were doing from WW2. Uh, Vera Lynn w couldn't get there, but we had Anne Shelton. And Anne Shelton came into Beacon, and I got to do an interview with Anne Shelton, who was the other forces sweetheart with Vera Lynn. And she was absolutely wonderful. She was a magnificently well-built lady, let's put it like that. She came and sat in the studio and she kept calling you darling. <laughs> she called you darling, you know. Me, I'm sat there all instant and things like that and it came in. But she, she was lovely. And your music varied from things like that to different things, different people. Um, anybody that they weren't certain of, it didn't happen. So one of the other spin-offs of it was that um, they started a fiesta in Wolverhampton in West Park and Blackstock, Mark Blackstock was the manager of it there, a huge manager, and he used to go to Beacon to have a Beacon personality as show, show, to do the stage uh, comparing. Um, he wanted that. Because I worked in the evening, I was available all day, every day, so the, the two girls who were the uh, prod girls for doing that, you say, Jim, will you do this, do that? And so I went and did the first uh, picture. And my first act I put on was the Chuckle Brothers. But poor old Barry Chuckle died last week, didn't he? You know, it was a great show. But he was a great character to work with. And I worked with Barry Chuckle. And I worked with Barry Chuckle and a girl off the Gladiators and the Backstreet Beatles. That was the lineup for the first fiesta that we did in West Park. And it was very successful. And I chatted my way through it. And that was the start of, uh, well, I'm still there now, working at the Civic Centre doing all the comparing work and doing all the intros and everything like that. I've, been, I, I've introduced Ken Dodd and all the other ones on stage up there. They're all part of spinning off from radio. It's a spin off from radio and it mm. comes in on that. And we did that. So they, these things happen and they're, they're nice. They, they go out and they work well. We're doing one, um, all sorts of different things that happen with it still. Mm. I suppose one of your things closest to your heart would be Wolfstock. Warsock was a great thing. Warsock was a great uh, occasion. Warsock was the country music festival. It was the biggest festival there was, you know. Was a, one. I have one of these awards for Warsock as the best festival in, in Great Britain of the year, you know. Um, the, all come back to Beacon again, come back to radio, because Beacon used to do a, a car show down in Himley Hall. And when they used to invite car dealers to come along, flog their motors, you know, you've got a new motor, John, and they'd have them all down there. To attract the people in there, they had two big tents. Um, Waggy had one tent where he had the be uh, beacon jocks in there with some pop stars in there. The other tent, he said, you can have that, Jim. Put in what you like. Well, I put country music in there. I put country music. It was the start of line dancing. So I got some line dancers to come along. I got three local bands to come along and play. I said, oh, Wag, what's my budget? He said, you haven't got one. So I had to go in and say, look, 
come and sit on my radio show and we'll do an interview and talk about you, you know, and give you some publicity. And that'll be it. But you come and play for me. That's what oh, we'd love to come and play for that. So we did two of those radio shows there. Um, Mark Blackstock from the Civic saw these shows and he said to me, I would like a country sh show in Wolverhampton as part of the curricula. So as uh, public entertainment. You can have Hickman Park, two days, and I'll give, he gave me barely enough to pay for three bands, but I managed to get enough bands in to play for two days. I think we had about five, six hundred people the first show, and it went in, and that started about 93, 94, when we started Wallstock. And gradually it grew there. We went The second year we went to Aldersley Stadium, which was a total disaster because nothing fitted in there and we had noise complaints from all the people and everything like that. So we then went back to Hickman. The next two at Hickman were so successful, I got it up to about 1500 in Hickman Park. The fire chief came down and said, you won't have another one of these in here. I said, why? He said, I can't get anybody in if there's an accident. If there's an accident, you can't get anybody to come through. So mm. it's got to move. So I relayed this to Mark Blackstone and he said, okay, we'll put it in East Park. So we went to East Park, we got a massive great park, let's have two stages, he said. So we put another stage down there and one up here. Um, gave me a bigger budget and it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And we had people who would come down from Scotland who were going down the West Country on holiday, would always come down so they came to Walsall. We had people that came from Malta every year, flew over, people from France. I had artists there from America, I had American artists, I had Australians, I had French, I had Belgium, German, I had all the cream of the British artists in there. The peak of it was um, Woolstock 20, Woolstock 21 or something. I had the biggest show that I had in there, it's the biggest festival they've had in Britain in country music. We had 11,000 people in there. Wow. We were going for a line dance one, that's how we know how many were in there, they were counted. Um, we had Barry Williams who was on Coronation Street and he was working at the Grand and he came on stage to do some line dance with us. So. We simultaneously started both stages at the same time, so we were doing the whole park. We had 11,000 people in there for that. And that is the highlight, that, that's the one I love. We'll stop, we'll stop forever. We go, ask anybody about we'll stop, we'll say it was the best festival ever. Right. And it was good. We, we tried bringing it back, we brought it back, we put it down the race course, things like that. It struggled, but things have moved on. We, we might revive it later on, I don't know. Yeah. Went up with WABC before, and WCR, and they'll come into it now. Yeah. So, we're there. I mean, WCR is doing a, a minor one this year. We're, we're doing the Canal Festival, which is a music festival up at Bentley Bridge. I mean, it's in a car park, where, like where we started back again. Uh, I've I got, I got four country bands on it. So we're talking uh, at this point with Woolstock in the mid 90s, of course, towards the later 90s, um, WABC changed the company, Beacon Company was taken over, and you ultimately moved on from there? Uh, we didn't move on, we were sacked. Ah. Uh, a company called GWR, Great Western Radio, <laughs> Railway, whatever you like, come out of Swindon, uh, came up there and they brought some people in and they had bright ideas, they, they knew all about radio. We did, we'd only been doing it since 76, you know. We had the highest listening figures there were around here, but they knew better. So they decided all us people had to go and they, they literally gave us a month's notice. And they said, you've just got to go, and that's it. Um, I was quite fortunate. I had uh, my fan appeal, my listener, <laughs> turned up in mobs, and we, 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 had, we, we stopped the Technal Road. We had a massive great crowd of people protesting outside there. It got put on television. It was on television that uh, they were there protesting about. They were taking Jim Duncan off the radio, and he's going on. A, and I actually got to talk on... Uh, uh, interview on there why they were doing it and things like that and I said well, it's, the progress has gone on we want the music that you play that's the music we want to hear we don't want this new stuff it's not in my backyard you know and it goes and we had this we, we made headlines on the Express and Star for about four nights running for it so somebody actually chucked a brick through the window down there you know we don't condone that sort of behavior but it makes good press. <laughs> it goes in. So we did that with me and a fella called Ian Perry, who was the other late night jock on Beacon. And the two of us there, we, we had we had the best fan appeal that there ever was you could ever get on radio. Mm -hmm. And actually, for one brief moment, I was famous, you know. I remember that time very well. <laughs> so what did you go on to do? I went on, because I'd done all the work at the Civic Hall, I got invited to go and work at the Civic Hall. So I, I went and worked at the Civic Hall, worked on the shows, 
did the different things that happen on the shows and we did all those. Um, I worked for the Civicos on marketing and things like that and I worked in that. I, I still work up there doing that for them as well, going out doing the bits and pieces. Although Civic Hall now is like beacon, it's faded into dust at the moment. So um, I went on to do that. People say to me, are you going to retire? I mean, I, I'm, I'm now, well, I'm turned 50. <laughs> <laughs> couple of times over really but uh, it's um, I would like to keep going until I then people say to me you know really you ought to stop because on radio when I'm coming out your speaker in your living room you haven't got a clue what I look like how old I am and what I am you know and uh, whether I put new batteries in my hearing aids or anything like that you know it's it's all part of it and it just comes in and you go on I, I think like Jimmy Young carried on Johnny Walker carried on for a long, long time, you know. You, you, you can broadcast. If you know, know your subject and you've got your music and you've got your audience, mm. why change it? True. Today, you're at WCR. I'm at Have... WCR. I love WCR. WCR, WCR uh, a couple of years ago, we, we came back with this great idea of 40 years of beacon sort of thing, and it came in. We, we had all the beacon jocks. Half the beacon jocks work here now. I, it, it's like most of the people I know, I mean, I knew you when you were at Beacon. I, I knew the other people, like the, the fellow that looks after all the bits, Andy Waters, who's one of the directors. He came there as a, a cable tire when he first started, didn't he? Well, well, you'd be upset if I called him that. But he came there, started off, and he was taught by one of the best engineers there were in the business, Bruce Warburton, who was an absolute genius on it. And he drenched that knowledge into Andy, and Andy can now go out and build radio so He built this one. Mm-hmm. Not this one, that one, and the others. He does those. Not only that, he looks after the BBC as well. But uh, it's things like that. It's the knowledge that B can put into it. I mean, we have Mick Wright playing tremendous great music. All right, he came from BRMP. We've got Les Ross comes in, and uh, oh, Les does some lovely shows there. You know, it's all good stuff, and it's all good. Radio is the thing that people love, I think. Radio is something you've got in your car. You know, p- people listen to radio. So I listen to taxi drivers playing WCR because we're Wolverhampton and they're driving around Wolverhampton we're talking about Wolverhampton other radio stations in this area are syndicated things they don't talk about Wolverhampton they can't pronounce half the names anyway mm. and they come out and we talk about it. so they, radio I think radio's still got a great future and the show you do is obviously the country show still as popular as ever do you find I think it's still as popular as ever it still goes as well I mean I'm still serviced with music from all the major labels, the major major stars and things like that. I, I did um, a couple of interviews a couple of weeks ago. With, I had like Darius Rucker came in. Darius Rucker's one of the new stars. Uh, Eric Pasley was one of the new ones that came in. Um, we get the new big American stars. They're all quite happy to come and talk to you and do the show with you. And they come in. Um, some of them will ring me from their home in Nashville. They ring into here in Wolverhampton to this radio station. And we go on air and we talk about it. Country music, country music, people's music. It goes out, a lot of people love it, you know, it goes out. It just goes, it works. So over the years, what are your favourites, would you say? Or who are your favourites? Um, it's very difficult to have favourites because, because you change all the time, you know, and you go in and you change with favourites. I think one of my all-time favourites, I, I lo- I've spoken about him a couple of times, Hank Williams. Hank Williams, like the father of country music. He did that. that was the first stuff I le- learned, and the first songs you learn are the ones you love. Really, they go through, and you do those. You you get artists. Um, George Jones, probably the most popular song ever. He stopped loving her today. It's a tremendous great song. I love that song. You've got a, a new artist that comes in, uh, Chris Stapleton. Late starter. He's forty odd, and he come in. His wife's just had twins, so he's still working. So he's there, and we get. He's done a couple of good songs. He's done a tremendous great song. They had a big C to C festival. He went on there with a trio, blew everybody else away and took it. Love his music, the Tennessee Whiskey. It's an old song. It's not, it's not even his own song. It's a song that was done by David Allen Coe earlier on. Years ago, David Allen Coe did that song. And it wasn't written by David Allen Coe, but it came out and things like that. The current one that goes in is when you get like a pop star that comes in, B.B. Rexar. Uh, with Florida Georgia Line, the biggest, most popular song ever on American radio. 36 weeks at number one on the Airplay chart. 36 weeks at number one for a song. Mm -hmm. That's over half a year. 
that song has been sat at number one. And Jocks have played number one. Okay, this is Florida's Georgia Line. This is BB playing along with them. Let's have the music. And it goes out. It loves that. You just love those things when they come out. Mm-hmm. You know. So we're in um, 2018 now. It's almost your 40th anniversary in radio. Yep. Coming up good, isn't it? You enjoyed it? I lovely enjoy it. It's great. Thank you very much for having me. And how are you? I'm not too bad. I had a bit of a disaster. Um, in 17, I sat in uh, the doctor's surgery. I got pains in my back and pains in my legs and that. And he looked me straight in the face and he said, you've got prostate cancer. Now, I've been to the doctors times before with because everybody knows about it. All the men should know about prostate cancer. When you're in the shower, don't just wash, check. Check and check again every day. Do it every day. If you notice a difference, go and see the doctor. He's not embarrassed. He won't be embarrassed about it. You won't be embarrassed about it either. Because when they finish with it, they do it. They measure, they do things and go like that. They take a blood test. They give you your PSA test. And they give you your PSA test. My PSA test, when it came back, when this man said it to me, he gave me a blood test that afternoon. Next morning, he rang me up and said, would I go into him? My PSA was seven. Should be two. It's two at the moment. They've reduced it down with injections. Tremendous service. New Cross Hospital has been absolutely wonderful. I had a bad bit spell a little while ago. Um, Kill the pain, stop so you can smile. It's, uh, they put you on morphine. In other words, uh, why people take drugs, don't ask me. Because morphine is the most horriblest thing you can have. I, I had morphine, I had morphine in the morning, midday and at night. The thing with morphine, it makes you terribly constipated. And terribly constipated, you get stuck and there. I ended up in hospital with it. And I was bad. And the, the doctor in hospital sat me down and he looked at me and he says, uh, you're bad, he said, and the problem with this is, it's not the cancer that's going to kill you. It's not the bits and pieces. It's your heart's going to stop. And he said, with what you've got and your constipation and that, he said, your heart could stop now. And there's no point in us resuscitating you. So we will mark your notes. And my notes have DNR at the top. Do not resuscitate. When somebody sits there and looks at you and says, don't resuscitate him, he's got a heart attack. I didn't want to be dribbling and somebody feeding me gruel up in the corner, you know, and not being able to recognise anybody or anything like that. I said, I don't want that, I'll go, but I want to die at home. He said, OK, we'll get you better, you can go home. So fortunately, that was a month ago, and I'm, I'm back again now, you know, I'm back. I've still got DNR written on the top, they're not going to take that off, but it's, it's a great thing, you know, pe- people can say about it, but, but don't be ashamed to talk to anybody with cancer about cancer, because you could be next. Hopefully not, but one in four do. And one in three don't survive. It can get, if you catch it early, it's fine. But do check, and do go in and check and do it. Get somebody to check for you. I mean, a job for the wife, she'll keep her happy for a little while, you know, if you do that, it goes in. You can do these things, it's good, you know, it goes in and you do that. Um, there is one downside of it, of course, if you do get prostate cancer and they give you the injections and you have these hormone injections, they're feminine hormone injections which stop the cancer spreading on your bones. Mine has stopped. I had a big scan the other day and my cancer has actually stopped spreading. They ain't going to cure it, but they've stopped it spreading, so that's good. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately with the feminine injections, bang goes the delights of being a man. It's gone, you've had it, it's finished, so work on it now. Don't ever let it go, you know, it goes in. You've got that, so that goes in and that's away, you know. But the other thing that comes with it, you get hot flushes. Mm. And you can sit there on air and you're describing something. We've got a great song, you know, this is a great song by Jason Aldean, we're going to do that. And sweat's pouring off you, you know. (laughs) When ladies talk about hot flushes, don't smile and laugh or anything like that, because if ever you get this, you will get them. And that goes into it but thank you for asking about it but do tell everybody all the men when you get to 35 40 start checking and do it regularly mm. it's got no it's got no stride who it goes to it'll go to each and every one and it mm. goes in but the service you get at new cross and the other ones you get great service from compton hospice or compton care as it's now called their service is absolutely brilliant they have a french doctor he is an absolute genius when it comes to talking about cancer and doing. Explains it to you. He puts it all up on the screen, and you see all, all the growth on your spine. I got him on my spine. They were going to send me to. 
up to Gaboin Hospital to have a, a metal tube put on my spine to stop it collapsing because if it collapses it, it'll cut your spinal cord and your legs drop off you know and your legs don't work so you have this that comes in with it but you've got people like that then you've got the Macmillan nurses who do absolutely wonderful things for you see those two charities don't turn the other way give them a hand they need it and mm. that's it but we're still there mm. and we're still going to make October in 40 years I'll tell you that now good stuff well, Jim, thank you for talking to us today. It's, it's been my pleasure. It's been fascinating going back over the years. And on a personal note, I just want to say thank you to you for, you, you know, in those early days, I learned quite a lot from you. So uh, thank you for that as well. And congratulations on your 40th year you. in radio. Thank you. Thank you. That's it from me. I shall be back next week and uh, I hope you will be as well. From me, thanks for the use of your speakers. <laughs>